Welcome to the Royal Television Society Thames Valley Centre's webinar, News in the New Norm. Shortly we'll be joining Tony Orme, the Centre's Chairman. But first, let's go to the weather. That's the forecast, stay safe and I'll see you soon. Good evening, uh, my name's Tony Orm, I'm the chair of the Thames Valley Centre RTS. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, this is a, a rather special evening because it's the first virtual online session uh, we've done. So uh, we've been spending a few days working out the technology um, and uh, we've, we've uh, found that it's uh, been so popular that we have a complete sellout audience. Um, tonight's theme is incredibly topical uh, as hopefully we're all adapting from working from home. And uh, it's a, a new and interesting uh, way of, of working for many of us, especially if you have to make television and radio programs. So tonight we have two guests. We have uh, Mor Mor Morwin Williams, is, is head of UK operations at BBC News, uh, leading the technical and studio teams of BBC News and is responsible for a creative technical news gathering, as well as all the new studio operations in London and Media City. She's the bridge between the BBC's journalism and technology, ensuring that technology is used to its fullest to tell stories better for its audiences. She's also joined by Robin Pembroke, who's Director of News Products and Systems. Uh, Robin is responsible for the teams who design, build and integrate the product, systems and digital products for the BBC News. And so now it's over to my colleague Simon Morris from the Thames Valley Centre, who will be hosting this evening's session. Simon. Thank you, Tony. Um, and invitation, thank you very much, Morwen, for accepting the invitation. I believe that you have a, a film that you'd like to show us before we get going with the interview. So broadcasting is hard work, and I can't do it alone, and that's why over the last one month, there's been one person who's been helping me record anything, uh, do my live reports as well, and that is this person right here behind the camera, my mother. Hi. 70 years old, a teacher, but also proved she's a great student as well. Right, Yes. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to show you a little bit of how things happen every time we have to go live. Okay. Nice? Yes. Alright. Yeah, the frame. Uh, yeah, I guess this is a little bit of moving, maybe. Yeah, okay. Am I straight now? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, this looks great. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we can start. Okay, so you can hit record, I'm ready when you are. Okay. A serious face. Can you show me? Welcome to our home studio. Look, I have an ice cream. <laughs> but don't tell anyone. This is Marley. He is a most valuable member of our working from home team. Uh, our resident Mr. Motivator, in fact. Marley, high five. Good boy. Clever boy. So you've seen my setup, but a lot of the times when I'm not live, I have to talk like this because my wife, who's also a TV journalist, goes live from the room next to mine. But right now she's prepping so I can talk normally. I'm just going to give you a glimpse of what this room looks like. That's me, huh? I'm joined now by Sam. Sam, if you could just sit down, please. Sit, Sam. Thank you. Why are you so quiet during the Today programme? Really? Good morning. It's six o'clock on Wednesday, the 15th of April. This is Today with Martha Carney and Nick Robinson. This is where I broadcast the Today programme in my basement, duvet on the wall in order to reduce the sound, Eric Cantona looking on, but my only connection with the studio and with Martha who's presenting with me today is on the screen there. And the terror is what if the bin men come, which they did the other day, because they're just outside there. You see, I thought you would bark all the way through it when the dustbin men came and the builders who were next door and the postman as well. So 
Can you explain yourself? Hey, I'm Ash, one of the BBC radio studio directors. So we need to be very quiet when we go into the studio. So what you just saw in the studio, or cubicle as we call it, was the red tape on the floor. That marks out the two metres to make sure that we're all social distancing. Also, there's a lot less of us in there, which means it's much quieter. So we now in the cubicle have one studio director, one studio manager, there's a producer of the news and the Today programme editor sat at the back. And what else we saw in there was our studio director today, Lee, using a phone and Zoom to maintain contact with the really presenters who are working remotely and the rest of the Today production team. I'm just going to script a line about Northern Ireland then to put in at this point. Innovation is the only solution. There is plenty of it about. Recording. The NHS scheme only covers England and Northern Ireland. Here correspondent Judith Moritz is at home in Manchester, working on a BBC News piece with her cameraman and editor Rob Wood, who is nearly 30 miles away in Derbyshire. The NHS scheme only covers England. In News Ireland. reports are the result of teamwork between correspondents, producers, camera operators and studio editors. Oh, and children too, who can make their presence felt when correspondents work from home. The biggest challenge about broadcasting under these conditions now would be having our presenters and all the guests working remotely. So it puts more pressure on our job having to establish and coordinate all of these connections. Uh, but one of the other aspects of this is the simple things like eye contact with our presenters. I didn't realise until now just how much we did rely on just hand gestures and having eye contact, which is now gone. The general atmosphere right now working under these conditions, of course, there's the underlying anxiety that I'm sure we're all feeling everywhere. But as a team, we've pulled much closer together. There's a really, really good feeling of teamwork and uh, we're all, I'd say, helping each other out and getting on with it. Oh, have you nothing to say? That's all from Sam. Ever. Amal Rajan in central London, working with producer Elizabeth in Kent, and editor Jonathan in North London, BBC News. What would be interesting, Maureen, to hear a little bit of your backstory, where you came from? Um, yeah, I um, uh, started life as a, a newspaper journalist and really always wanted to get into broadcasting. So I um, uh, got a job at, uh, in regional television on what was then London Plus, became Newsroom South East. Um, started as a researcher, worked my way up to be programme uh, output editor, uh, and also um, then worked into the, the network newsroom as a news organiser, the person that organises all the, the TV and radio, and is, is literally at the heart of, of the news centre. Also worked in the Manchester, deputy editor of the Manchester Northwest Tonight programme as well, but um, the lure of the network newsroom dragged me back and uh, I went on to be um, assignment editor for uh, news gathering, mainly specialising in um, special events. Um, and so I've done some of the, of the really big events uh, of the last sort of 20 years, royal weddings, deaths, funerals, major uh, NATO summits, all those sorts of things, as well as the big breaking news stories and uh, deputy planning editor as well. Before I, I took a turn about four years ago to move on to the more technical side, uh, I'd always been interested in it, done some of those big set piece events where you need a lot of technical um, knowledge, but the journalism as well. And so the chance to have this role that breached the two, um, I, I didn't really think maybe four years ago it, it worked as well as I think it does now with the, the help of Robin and, and some of his team. We've, we've worked really hard. It used to be like that and, and it needed to be a bit more like that and, uh, and it is a lot now. So um, we've worked really hard to bring that together and um, to you know, help translate, as you said earlier, about the journalism, translate the technology and the journalism together. The journalists don't need to know the in-depth technical detail. They just want to know what works and how it works. And I, I need to really also work out what they need to enable them to do their job better. And with Robin's teams as well, working alongside them, that's all we try to do. 
we just have to remember it's about the story it's about the story that's all we're trying to do it's about the stories for our audiences uh, and and the journalists very much see the technology just needs to do that um, that's the end game it's making it all better for the audiences so Morwen, a little while ago i think it was last year you were given a rise award um can you tell us a bit about rise and what the award means to you Yes, I've been delighted to work with RISE for the last couple of years. RISE is the women in broadcasting uh, and very much seen to, to be um, uh, something that was uh, needed still in, in the area. They do great lots of work about uh, mentoring um, uh, some up and coming people, some already uh, established people. And, and I've mentored two great people for the last, the last two years. Um, uh, and just the organisation, what they did, and they were kind enough to, uh, for their inaugural awards, which were in, uh, which were presented at IBC last year, mm -hmm. to make me their woman in, in woman of the year, which caused great merriment in my household, where uh, uh, I'm not even woman of the year in my own house. But um, anyway, they they were kind enough to give me that, and it's meant a, a lot to me. And um, we all need to support the diversity, all sorts of diversity, um, in our industry. Excellent. So moving on a bit, um, the impact of coronavirus, because obviously this is um, something that has impacted television and radio and all aspects of media as well. So um, from a journalism perspective, how's the workflow, um, how's the workflow changed? Well, I mean, as soon as socially, uh, social distancing set in, we had to do things very differently from, um, I'm in charge of the teams that go out, uh, as well as teams in, in New Broadcasting House and, and Salford, as, as you said. So just in, team, to, in terms of the teams that go out on the road, the way you make a story is usually a television story, it's usually with a reporter, um, a, a producer uh, and a camera person. Uh, and they can't all be together in the back of a, a van, we've got some edit vans, where you would normally edit a piece on the on the road because it's all too close together, and um, you're sitting in a space, you know, really tightly together. So um, we've we, we worked out a Zoom workflow for editing in the in the field, where people would either sit in their own cars or they would go home and 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 edit. We've even done a Zoom workflow in three different continents where people. Uh, uh, work work together uh, in different continents. So that's been the out on the road. But, but you know making sure everybody had the long poles for the microphones and 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 had all the kit to do the social distancing and, and just doing that slightly differently in the building we had to make sure i mean a lot of people who could work from home but so many of the people that work work for me and, and you know i and i have total admiration and appreciation for all those who are coming into the building who are still going out in the field our teams are being terrific and they they you know have my full admiration um but coming in you you need it you all those television galleries you can be pretty closely packed and you didn't have two meters so we've actually had to take out some roles luckily we've got automation in some of our uh, in, in most of our news galleries these days so we've taken out the vision mixer to create one extra space uh, uh, and uh, we're doing it on an automated way and then we've just had to rejig things maybe sometimes put auto queue in a in a different spare uh, gallery uh, and just do things differently we've really had to rethink everything uh, and in radio as well again the film showed how we've socially distanced in our, our radio cubicles and, and put literally put tape on the floor to remind people they can't go uh, in that space because it's somebody else's space and you must have seen some quite remarkable things happening with um, uh, with all of this. Uh, are there some things that have really struck you as, as truly remarkable in this time? I mean, yeah, it's just... It, it, it... It's just those sorts of, the ingenuity has been the thing. And, you know, I have got some fantastic people uh, in my team, but the ingenuity that has come to the fore of, of creating things and how they've um, got, got around the social distancing to till, still try and make great content uh, and to still keep uh, most of our uh, great shows on the air for all the, for the audiences has, ju has just been amazing. Um, and yeah, just keep wanting to be, to go that extra mile and to be uh, inventive. And, you know, some of the things you, you, you've seen, like the way they've been um, uh, doing the clapping every, every Thursday night, you mentioned that. 
uh, just you know wanting to get great shots and better shots and how you do that and we did that as part of the big night in last week and it, it was a really great representative of the, the whole of the UK um, rather than just a few locations we, we really try to um, use people's own iPhones to, 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 um, to do that and get a lot more. We've been doing a lot more of mobile journalism as well. We've issued some, I'll, I'll show you a, a kit, nothing like a, an actual prop rather than a film. Um, so this is a, a little kit, you slide your iPhone in uh, like that one uh, there. That's mine on a tripod, which I sometimes use for extra calls. Um, but this is, um, the, the trouble with the iPhones are, uh, and the phones, it's, it's always the sound. So here's a, that just plugs in, uh, and you get a little uh, kit of parts, and we've given We've given out several hundred of these. We'd already uh, do that sort of thing and, and give them out, but actually people have really started using them a lot more. And, and the apps, and probably Robin will talk about some of the apps, but our contribution apps that we've been using have really come to the fore, both for lives and for um, uh, material we can send in our, in our own uh, BBC um, home, homegrown app called uh, Portable News Gathering PNG. Fascinating. So. Um... I, when I spoke to you before, you spoke about the Harvard Media Transformation Challenge. And it seems that it was one of those things that happened to you at pretty much the right sort of time. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yes, and, and, and Robin's a, a fellow of, uh, of it as well in its uh, previous incarnation as the Salzburger when it was at Columbia. So I did mine at, at Harvard and, and literally only finished it in January and um, never has a better time come for having learned some of the tools from that, how to adapt. Um, it is, as it says, on the tin, a media transformation challenge. So about 30 um, uh, broadcasting and um, uh, media colleagues, uh, it wasn't, wasn't all broadcasting. We had to go and take a, an issue for our, our employers and we went back four times during the year and had to work on it. And actually really some of the tools that we learnt from that have been great in responding to a crisis, but also the cohort of people we've met several times in lockdown and um, to talk about how we can help each other, how we can learn from each other. Um, the best we've come up with so far is a very long list of questions and only a few answers, but, but, but we'll get there. In terms of management style, it sounds very much as though you're um, concerned with unleashing skilled people rather than trying to you know, push them down a particular path. Um, uh, most of the people that work for me unleash themselves anyway, uh, Simon. They, 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 are, they are creative and uh, I, I wouldn't want to have them uh, not unleashed. It, it's just, you know, everybody needs to just remember the social distancing and, and, and things like that. So that, it, it's, it's hard. It's hard to do your job in these circumstances. Um, um, I'm lucky enough to, to be able to work from home for a lot of the time. Uh, and we're in a 12 week isolating house anyway. Um, so I haven't really got a choice. Um, but it, it's, uh, you know, it, it's not a matter of, of um, uh, not unleashing them. But they, everybody wants to go out and do their very best. So, uh, again, it's, it's just harnessing the talent that we've already got. Another thing that seems to have been quite fortuitous is um, the development. I mean, you've been doing quite a lot of in-house developing developments with various apps and so on. But equally... There have been a lot of apps appearing for iPhones and Android devices as well. Um, so, how 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 are they fitting into your uh, into this situation? Yeah, the last two or um, last two or three years, really, mobile journalism's really taken off, uh, and uh, we've got a whole team, mobile journalism and innovation, um, working for me, where we we. Um, connect our journalists with some of the, the, the things I've shown you uh, and, and the apps that make contribution easier. I mean, the cameras on these phones are, are extraordinary these days. Um, as I say, sometimes the sound lets you down, but, but there are even ways around that. And you can even edit whole packages um, uh, on, on them these days. So we did a pilot about a year ago. Um, it, it, it was around the time of Prince Harry's wedding, so it was about a year ago. And, and we asked 10 of our camera people to put down their big shoulder mount cameras and to take up what was then the iPhone 10 and to go and produce content on, on those for a month and to see what it would be like. So in the hands of a top craft person, 
what would it be like? Um, and we had some great results. I remember it, it was the day Stephen Hawking died and we sent um, one of the camera crew, Andy, went out with John Kay, our, our um, West of England correspondent, and they went to a science fair and um, we, uh, they wanted to interview some children. What did Stephen Hawking mean to you? And we've all interviewed children before with cameras and they all do a bit of messing around and it, it, it's um, the product's probably not quite as good but they're all used to having a mobile phone in your face uh, and the product we got that, that it was we captured some great reactions uh, and and the tribute to that was that the six o'clock news didn't know it was made on a mobile phone uh, and sometimes when people find things like that out they find a way to drop it later on and they ran it on the 10 o'clock news without any changes. And that was a real tribute to how Andy and the team had achieved that, that piece and how you can tell a different story um, with the size of the phone. I think sometimes when you're doing difficult stories, a really big camera can intimidate people. Uh, and whereas an iPhone, um, as I say, that's what people are used to. So how has this changed this situation? How's it changed the um, uh, management of the workforce? It's really good to be able to do this. I do a Zoom once a week with invite all staff to it. I've got a team of about 700. I get about 120 on it, which is great. Um, and, you know, we can just bob around all the areas. Everybody can get a, a, an idea on what everybody else is doing. Now, in normal life, I have an all staff meeting once every three months because we can't get a space big enough in new broadcasting house for everybody and you have to book them up. And um, so I, I really think, I mean, as much as I'd, I'd love to keep doing that once every three months, I'm going to do a lot more of them like this. So that's one lesson learned because we can just speak, you know, spin things up really quickly and get, get round people and keep in touch a lot more. So I'm, I'm, I'm liking that aspect of it. I'm not liking not seeing everybody in, in person because, you know, we're in a creative industry and, and somewhere like New Broadcasting House for, for all its faults is a great buzzy place uh, and so Salford as well at, at, um, at, at uh, Salford Keys there, it's the media city, fantastic buildings and um, so you do miss that like quite a lot but we're, we're working around it and we're keeping in touch and some of my teams have daily calls with, with some of their teams so um, we, it's all working. One thing that occurs is that training must be uh, quite an issue, ensuring that everyone's across things. I mean, presumably you have the early adopters who rush ahead, people like uh, the weatherman, and um, you have people who, who need perhaps a bit more help. How are you handling training? Um, we can, we're doing a lot over Zoom. I mean, our trainer is, is uh, Dan, is, is pretty full tilt with his Zoom lessons. Um, so we are managing to do quite a lot of it. Uh, and when we've um, had to send people, um, people who've had a, a former skill, maybe as a studio manager, and they're coming back um, to help us out where we've not got enough people to, to keep the programmes on air, they're, they're, we're sort of retraining them and refamiliarising them over, over Zoom as well or, or any other any other outlet. But um, yeah, so it's, we are, we are doing it and it's, uh, and actually the people who are self-isolating at home and, and can't do their job are catching up on online training videos and there's a whole wealth of them so they can actually broaden their skills. Uh, one thing, one last question if I may, which is um, when things go back to some form of normal, how much, of, how much do you think will remain of uh, of what you're doing now how much how long do you think it will continue or do you think we will ever go back or or what i mean i think it's gonna to have to be a really gradual return isn't it i mean we're not going back mm. in any social distancing around for quite a, quite a long time so we're going to have to have very phased returns um, and I, I, don't, I really don't think we'll see the levels of, of people back in the building for, for, for a very long time. Um, if, if we're taking the lessons learned, it would be great to take some of the lessons, the, the good things out of this and, and keep them on, like having more regular meetings because we can do it with the technology uh, and things like that. And maybe for even some of the remote editing, if it, if it just means people get a better work-life balance rather than all sit around waiting till the piece goes out and then go home, you know, maybe something more can be done like that. But, but we'll, we'll, we'll look at all these things when, it's, when we're a little bit further away from the, uh, 
the actual event itself. But we're, we're, we're starting to make a note of things. What's worked well? What hasn't worked well? What we want to keep? Uh, we definitely go back to. Morwen, thank you very much. And I hope you'll hang around because there'll be some questions uh, before the end of the event. I Lovely. hope you'll hang around to answer them. Um, so if we may now go to Robin, who is the um, running the content production workflow group. Um, that's not what's on your LinkedIn, Robin, um, or, or on the BBC site. Um, anyway, I'm very interesting to hear your um, how you came to be where you are now. Yeah, sure. So I've um, been at the BBC about seven years um, and I joined as the as the head of the digital digital product for news. So um, head of product for BBC News. Um, uh, before the BBC, um, I'd run the, the the digital product teams for ITV and before that global radio. And um, so I'm from a digital product background, originally back with Yahoo was running Yahoo's um, European product development teams, and we rolled out Yahoo News across uh, across Europe. Um, at the BBC, after that initial role, um, about four years ago, we merged the broadcast technology and the digital technology teams together because increasingly our production processes are more converged. You know, we're we're planning, we're publishing across digital and broadcast platforms, and so we. We brought together those um, those broadcast and digital technology teams, which I ran the combined group of that. Um, and like I said, the last two or three years, the biggest project that we'll have done is expand out the the world service um, out from 27 to 40 languages, which was a big uh, logistical technical issue. And you know, although uh, you know nothing quite like the uh, the situation that we've just found ourselves in over the last uh, over the last six weeks. So, um, how, how how has your role changed in these last six weeks? <laughs> um, well, apart from <laughs> working here, um, I mean, we, it, so it was what, it was six weeks ago on Monday that we, with all of our teams, um, we've basically moved to a model where all of our teams are working remotely. So, uh, unless we've got teams who absolutely have to be in physical premises which tend to be if they're in support roles um, any of our teams that are either managing projects or who are building or integrating the software applications by and large they can they can do that remotely and they can uh, you know they can um, and and so we've we've got all virtually all of our technology division in the BBC is now working from home um, and the biggest Logistical issue, interestingly for us, was actually not with Morwen's teams who are, you know, they're used to being out on the road day in, day out. They're, you know, that's, that's what they do. Um, as the BBC, it was, we basically had to shift about 15,000 people who work inside our offices to them all working from home. And in the first couple of days, it was pretty hairy because it created enormous strain on the volume of people that were coming in through uh, VPN gateways to access systems that are normally accessed on our network uh, and suddenly everybody was coming in through um, remote access gateways we we use Zscaler um, and it was in it was it was it was those two things with the with with the really the initial pain point um, I think then as as Mormon was saying the Interestingly, the things that we had to react to the quickest was being able to do emergency releases around some of those production applications so that they would work faster with so many people accessing them remotely. And we did see in those first couple of weeks quite a big reduction in the number of people that were available to work. I think in Morin's teams, it was about 25, 30% in the first couple of weeks where people were having to self-isolate. So we had to do a lot of work around re, uh, around combining how we schedule and rotate teams um, and share guests um, and reconsolidate studios and things like that. But broadly, it's been uh, overall it's been surprisingly smooth. We haven't had any giant meltdown of any of those systems, despite an extraordinarily fast and massive change in how they're used. I mean, people must have been doing things that they haven't done before. So presumably there was a, a training and experimentation phase as well. Yeah, I think, um, 
yeah, I think it, it is fascinating because we, you know, what, what we do day in, day out is we roll out new systems. And thank goodness we had just rolled out um, Zoom to everybody in, in the BBC um, and that we had just rolled out said Scalar as a, 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 as a VPN uh, client. We were thankfully uh, about 80% through rolling out a new planning and collaboration tool called Wolf Tech that, that Mormon's the sponsor of. Um, and um, so we were in, uh, we were in a strong position of quite a lot of the applications had been recently updated, but it's really interesting in, in business as usual times, you would, you would take months to roll out a system and you would do very, very careful training. Um, but what we've done in the last couple of weeks, we've just done an upgrade to, um, our video uh, media asset management system and edit client, which is called Jupiter. Uh, we've just created a fully web version of that. We would have been rolling it out quite progressively with training, but we've just basically made it available to people. And what we found is that people like Owen, the, the weather presenter you, you showed, you were talking around earlier, they're actually creating their own how-to guides for each other and distributing those around internally. It's really nice. It's, it, 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 it's, some of it is formal and some of it is quite an organic process. Presumably the, um, the impacts to television and radio are different. How would you characterize them? Or how would you see the difference? Yeah, I think, I mean, with radio, um, the big shift has just been, and not just with news, but on network radio and local radio, um, a big shift for presenters to work and present directly their entire shows end to end from home. Um, and so there was just a, a, a big logistical issue of being able to ship kit out to people's, um, you know, out to their homes. Um, issues to be frank with people's broadband connectivity. Some presenters have got dedicated lines that are already in. Others are relying on on standard home broadband connections, we were really grateful to um, uh, to BT OpenReach who um, reached out to us to do kind of line quality checks, regardless of who their supplier was. And we've been trying to manage those. A couple of hairy moments with people like Martha on the Today program um, had a couple of issues in TV. Um, it, the biggest changes have actually been inside new broadcasting house or inside the studios where we've, where we've had to massively reduce the number of people who come into NBH. We've therefore reduced the number of studios that are producing live output. So you'll see that Newsnight and Andrew Marr and, are now coming from the same studio as the main bulletins. Um, and, um, and as I say, I think, as I alluded to before in TV, in some ways the biggest impact was the impact on the number of people available on rotors and how we had to reconfigure the main broadcasting hubs. Um, so one thing that interests me, I mean, we've been using WhatsApp and you may have heard it pinging in the background periodically <laughs> as yeah. we ran into issues. So how do you handle talkback on radio and television? Uh, yeah, well, um, well, in some of those situations in radio, we will have a dedicated line into in, into presenters' homes, and if it's a if it's a music show, then obviously when you know music's coming out, they can talk back down the same line. Uh, normally, what we're doing is using um, uh, solutions that work over their broadband connection in parallel with that. So, um, trying to think, you know, I, IPD DTL is one that we use. Uh, clean feeds is is another that's widely used um, in the market, and then and and WhatsApp, as you say. I mean, if you look at certain teams like uh, the team that are doing the corona the, uh, the coronavirus cast, the ex Brexit cast team, Dino Sophos and and Laura and Adam and Chris Mason, uh, what they use is WhatsApp. They don't just use it to talk back when they're actually recording, but they're 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 also using it to plan and collaborate the show as well. It's it's a very they use it throughout their whole production life cycle. And so what's the balance between in-house and um, commercially available apps that have been serviced in this? It's a mix. I, I think I'd struggle to put a percentage on it. Um, what we, and we don't, it's interesting because the, the thing with the rate of tech change that's happening and the quality and, and 
fast changing capabilities of these B2C apps that are out there, we would be, it would be impossible, nor would it be the right thing for us to do to, to, to stop people from, from using commercially available apps and only use the BBC production tools. So what we've, one of the things that we've got at the moment is an internal website called Fab Gear, which people can, um, which covers any, all selection of, of apps that people can use to, um, to, to work remotely. And it's, it's a mixture of, the internally developed or approved BBC apps, the way we've got full 24 seven support for those. They've, you know, they've obviously gone through full information security checks. And then there's a second tier of things, which are apps that our ISOC team will have gone in and will have said, yes, we know it's secure. We're not compromising security by people using it, but we might not be able to provide, you know, 24 seven support because it's a third party non-supported app. Um, I think it varies. I think in radio, it's it's in radio, it's I would imagine it's about fifty fifty. I think in TV, the skew is much much more to the standard set of, of, of BBC apps that we've got down the line. You you mentioned some early adopters, but what's the relationship between, should we say, a, a person who decides dis, creates workflows and establishes workflows, and people yeah. like um, your, your drumming weatherman? <laughs> how, how does that work? Is there an official process, or is there something you, you you just do on an ad hoc basis? I think we we it's um, we try to work it in a um, we we try to work in quite an agile fashion, and I know that that can sometimes be quite a uh, a hackneyed um, a hack, it's a phrase that's used a lot. But in terms of trying to drive agile business change, what we're doing is that we we focus we've got we have clear priorities in terms of the outcomes that we're trying to change, we will pick certain um, certain production processes that we want to innovate around. But what we then tend to do is to kind of find spot innovative production teams who want to do something different and put them together with the technical product team, and we just and we allow them to experiment and we and we encourage them to experiment. If I'll um, there's one example actually that we've used with um, Zoom going through to our live pages that I could, I can just show you a little bit of that in action. Um, he says with hesitation, <laughs> moving to, moving to screen share. Um, let's see if this works or not. So um, you, you should see our prime minister. Yes. Thumbs up. Yes, you can. I'm getting a thumbs up from Morland. Very good. All right. So these are the BBC um, News Life pages. They're, they're our most engaged pages digitally uh, across the BBC. Huge audiences. You can see um, they're some of the most engaged pages on the internet in the UK. Actually, they, they, they did, Today, we had a concurrent audience of around 400,000 on this. Um, that sometimes goes up to a concurrent audience of 2 million. Um, in really peak times. Um, they have a live video at the top. They have the live blog underneath. Um, and what we've been experimenting with is instead of just having um, the live news channel playing at the top is to be able to use Zoom and digital new digital streaming tools that we've got to be able to have kind of live two ways, um, either between different journalists or increasingly, and this is really exciting in terms of being able to have, you know, multiple conversations with um with 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 users and 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 with the general public so this was a q and a around coronavirus that uh, bbc east did last week um it streamed live out to facebook live and to our own live pages um with nikki fox and richard westcott they were using a, an in-house tool that we're developing called silver um which basically does um the live it does the live transcoding it does the source management it allows you to then point that feed through to any online destination being a bbc page a facebook live page we could put it through to tv if we wanted um and this film which i'll i'll, I'll be quiet and let you listen to it i'll show you a couple of clips is a mixture of the presenters so you can see nikki and richard there together with martin who's the producer and then Rashid and Ollie and Tessa here, they are actually the technology team that have built Silver. 
and you'll hear them they're using zoom to talk about how they're going to work but also how the product now see in the top left of my zoom window that the webinar has now started streaming on the live custom you hear custom that? live streaming service and if you head on over to silver so you can see what they do kind where of we the, uh, the thing that we set up here. earlier yeah 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 back to silver that they're using uh, that's the a technical here. fault slate how do I using Zoom how do I put how the, the um, works. you will want to click preview on oh, the closed yeah. slate and going yeah. through uh, that process yes yeah right okay yeah <laughs> yeah they actually right. have uh, yeah, those, yeah those buttons were really slightly easy. not quite intuitive play they actually found things that they wanted to change with the product um, and the team have been able to change the layout of some of the buttons so that the producers find it much more like a live gallery that they would be using to control TV as opposed to, and so that the two experiences between TV and online live management are synchronized up. So, you know, just a really nice experience there. When that came together, it meant it streamed to Facebook Live, to our live pages. It was teased out at the end of the evening news um, on BBC East. And um, yeah, seems to, seems to have worked really well. Well, thank you very much, Robin. Um, it would be a good idea now, I think. So we've, it's been so interesting um, talking to you both, but I'd like to hand over now to Tim, who's been following tracking questions on the, the chat. Um, Tim. Thank you, Simon. Uh, yes, I've, I've been trying to keep an eye on things and listen to what's been going on, which is fascinating. Uh, several themes have emerged. I mean, one of these, I'm old enough to have been whacked over the hand with a screwdriver for bringing really exciting footage in, but it didn't meet the Evesham standards. Um, have, have you found there's been a fight between the strict technical purists and the passionate storytellers? I uh, don't know. I think, do you know what? Everybody's, uh, everybody's just pulling together to do, to, to do things. And I think when this all's hit us, we just had to work so hard just to keep on doing what we were trying to do. I don't think that, you know, there was any, any fighting at all. Um, I think, do you think I'm right, Robin? I think everybody just completely pulled together. I think what's interesting is that on so many levels, there are things that we are now doing that we would not, there would have been so much resistance to doing it six weeks ago. Yeah, there's no way that you would have said um, that you would have persuaded like the Andrew Martin that they should go from the same studio as the bulletins. Now, it, will that will that stay like that? Probably not. That will that will I would imagine go back to its own studio. But equally, would you have run programs where virtually all of the input is coming in through through Zoom or through people skyping in from their homes? No, but it, the, the quality might be different. I heard um, Declan, who runs English Regions News, um, in one of the calls earlier this week saying for them, they feel it's just really changed the relationship with the viewer, that whereas before, um, this was all about, um, it, this was all of us about, you know, walking up to people on the street and asking them their opinion, is that, you know, the viewers are kind of inviting us into their homes and, and it creates a very different dynamic, you know, with, with um, the interaction with audiences is very different. I think that will stay. I think that's uh, that blend of how it works will be will be different. You know, even for a consummate pro politician or, or professional, or, or uh, and and for anybody, anybody, it can be a scary thing walking into a TV studio. And actually, if you're here in your own home and you know you've just got the light on and you're talking to to a screen, do, do you actually get a better interview with somebody because they're slightly more relaxed? Uh, and, and I think we're finding a bit of that. So, so, so building on that, Simon Waldman's asked is, do you think there will come a time when we don't need to go back to using the studio, but the whole, get, it, get rid of the news gallery and we can actually do it all remotely? I don't think I'd go that far. <laughs> we are still absolutely using our galleries to bring everything together and they are the absolute heart and hub of our our TV programmes and the cubicles for our radio programmes. Uh, and, and actually, on the Today programme, moving to radio for a second, while your, remoters are pre are, are, uh, while your presenters are remote, 
it's the it, it's my guys, the studio directors, studio managers, who are the ones that still need yeah. to come in. So there are still some things you would get a very different product, and if you want that product going forward, and um, uh, and there there will be things we can we can do remotely in a in a, in a, and have a different product, but it won't quite be the same same product. And in some cases that will be absolutely fine. So I think going forward, we won't be as, as afraid of these things. As, as Robin said, things just literally had to change overnight because they had to. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, with live, with, sorry, with, with, with live output management, as we've demonstrated tonight, there are still a lot of technical limitations. Now, and what we're finding is, is that with the production tools, the editing tools, most of those now have completely cloud hosted versions. Uh, interestingly, uh, just this week, um, Grass Valley, who we use for a lot of us, a lot of the studio automation and um, uh, for a lot of our video asset management work have just, they've just launched a product which is a completely cloud based live output management and they're demoing it with esports companies um, in the States. Um, similarly, Wolf Tech, who we use for planning and for deployment, uh, RTL in Germany are just trialing, um, again, cloud-based um, live output management. So it, it, I think I still think we're a couple of years away technically from it being possible to do full live output management from cloud-based applications. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, I did have a tradition when I was an SM of crashing the pips, and I'm trying not to do it in, in this stage of my life. Uh, so for fear of that, uh, thank you very much, everyone who's asked the questions. I'm sorry I haven't been able to get around all of you. Um, but can I hand back to Tony, please? Thank you, Tim, and and thank you, Simon. Uh, yeah, I, I've, I spent quite a few years in my early career working uh, as an engineer on SNG trucks. And uh, I, I know just how difficult live television is. It's, it's great fun, though. But uh, thank you to Morwen and, and Robin for joining us this evening. Um, uh, it's been uh, very insightful, and, and uh, I'm uh, fair to say we've all, all learned a great deal. So uh, I'd just like to thank everybody else, uh, our audience, for joining us. And please look out for the uh, next um, um, next uh, Zoom show we do. And uh, we'll be sending you emails and publicizing that on uh, social media. So uh, thank you, and uh, good night. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks for having us.